do to you. It's the year of the tiger very shortly in the, in the Chinese system of years. Um, but here we are at the start of the spring term, uh, at the start of our talks from the British Museum, where we use objects from the British Museum collection, some of which are on display, uh, all of which are available through our online collections online database, which you can access through the main website. And today we are going to be doing a talk about a selection of cities across the United Kingdom and having a look at what objects from these cities in the British Museum collection tell us about not only the individual history of that city, but also about urban development in Britain. So to begin, I am just going to pull up my screen, which means that we can start our PowerPoint for today. From beginning, always a good place to start. I will also pick up my laser pointer because there'll be some details on some of the objects which we'll be looking at more closely during the talk. So today we're looking at British UK cities. So what is a city? Well, a city is a permanent, densely settled place where the population work primarily in non-agricultural tasks. So in effect, it's distinguished from other human settlements by its size, function, and symbolic status. And cities themselves generally have extensive systems for housing, transportation, sanitation, land use, production of goods, and communication. And some of those themes will pop up as we go through our talk today in reference to either a specific city or to a specific object. So by 2015, 69 places in the United Kingdom had been granted C status by letters pattern or royal charter. And objects discovered via urban archaeology or objects collected by heritage experts give us an insight into how cities function and also specific historic moments in a city's history. And we are going to begin by going to the north of England and we are going to begin with the city of York. And here you can see on the screen some objects which come from the Roman period of York's history. Now by the time Britain became part of the Roman Empire, the area around modern York was already home to an Iron Age tribe known as the Brigantes. The tribal area initially became a Roman client state which meant that in effect, the Romans sought to uh, increase their sphere of influence by setting up political and often financial alliances with existing Iron Age leaders in England. But later, his later hostilities between the Romans and the Brigantes saw the Ninth Legion sent into Brigantes territory. And in AD 71, the Ninth conquered the Brigante and built a wooden military fort on flat ground near the River Ouse. The fort itself covered 50 acres with a garrison of 6,000. The site of the fort headquarters lies under York Minster and excavations in the undercroft of the Minster have revealed part of the Roman structure. So in terms of York as a proto-city settlement, we're really looking to the Roman period when we have the first permanent established buildings on the site of what we today would call the city of York. And we have here to the left a silver denarius coin, and this shows the Emperor Vitalis who was one of the emperors in AD 69. And on the other side of the coin, you can make out a bowl standing on a tripod with a dolphin and a raven, 
all symbols of the Roman god Apollo. Now, the coin that we have in our collection has a very worn backside. So I've popped underneath an image of another coin, the same coin, but with less wear, so that you can see the detail of the dolphin, the bowl standing on its three-legged tripod stand, and the raven just underneath. Now, the British Museum coin was minted in Rome, but excavated in York, demonstrating the circulation of Roman currency through military salaries and trade in early Roman Britain. And the Empress Hadrian, Septimus Severus, and Constantinius I all visited York. And during his 2007 to 2011, sorry, his 207 to 211 stay, Septimus Severus proclaimed York capital of the province of Britannia Inferia and granted York the privileges of a colony or a city before he himself died in the city in early 211. And what we see here on the right hand side of the screen is a Roman roof tile from the city of York and this tile in common with many other terracotta roof tiles found in early Roman Britain, was made under the auspices of the Roman legions and is therefore stamped with the legions insignia. And this particular tile, if we look here at the depressed rectangular area, this is where the damp terracotta was stamped before being put out, usually on sand beds to dry, before being fired, we see that it's been stamped with a Latin inscription referring to the Ninth Legion Hispania. So a legion, the Ninth Legion, with a reference to Hispania, the Roman province, which nowadays the country of Spain. And the Ninth Legion itself operated from the first century BC until at least AD 120. It was stationed in Britain following the Roman invasion in AD 43, but the legion disappears from surviving Roman records after AD 120. And the fate of the legion is the subject of considerable research and speculation. Our tile here shows us that the legion were garrisoned in what was by then um, an established Roman fort at York, and that they were producing tiles as part of the Roman constructions to build up the fort and surrounding settlements. Now, one theory was that the legion was wiped out in action in Northern Britain soon after 108. And this is the date of an inscribed stone tablet from the rebuilding of York Fort in stone. So again, we have a piece of material culture which links the legion to the city of York, this time with a date of 108. Inscriptions for the 9th were later found on a legionary base in the Netherlands, suggesting that they were based there from 120, leading to suggestions that they were destroyed, not in Britain, when they were stationed in Northern England, but during the second century. Certainly, the ninth did not exist during the reign of Septimus Severus, so they would never have been in York at the same time as he was, since the ninth was not included in two identical independent lists of the 33 legions extinct at the time during the reign of Septimus Severus, some of which were stationed in Britain and some of which were used by Septimus Severus from his base at York for an attempted invasion of Scotland. So sticking with York, let's move forward from the Roman period and have a think about 
one of the next major and indeed famous stages in the city's history that we have evidence for here at the British Museum. So what we're looking at here are objects from the Anglo-Saxon and Viking period of the city's history. Now, the city of York was settled by the Angles in the 400s and by the 600s, it had become part of the Kingdom of Northumbria. Now, in 875, Danish Vikings raided and took control of York. York, of course, as we know, being on the east side of England, so providing easy access to the city across the maritime routes across the North Sea from Denmark. And the city, now known by its Viking name of Jorvik, developed as a major river port and indeed became the capital of Viking territory in Britain with more than 10,000 inhabitants at its peak. Danes migrated to the region and settled and there's archaeological evidence from this time of textile production, metalwork, carving, glasswork and jewellery making. And materials from the Persian Gulf have been discovered, suggesting that the town was part of an international trading network. In 954, the last Viking king, Eric Bloodaxe, was expelled and his kingdom and the city of York was incorporated into the Anglo-Saxon state. So what we are looking at here are two objects from the specifically Viking period of York's history. And to the left, we can see we've got Norse coinage. And this coin was struck, was made in York at the Jorvik Mint. And it is inscribed with the name of Anlaf Guthrison, who ruled York from 939 to 941. And it also includes the regal title, which at this point is not the title Rex, which the Anglo-Saxon kings were using coming from the Roman, the Latin, but came from the old Norwegian Kanyugra, meaning military leader. So sort of a cross uh, between a king and a military leader, I suppose nowadays we'd say a warlord. And this particular coin has a raven with outstretched wings. And this is a Viking symbol linked to the god Odin, who had two ravens who sat on either arm of his throne. And he was said to send them out every morning to fly around the world and bring him back all the latest news. The symbol of the raven, which we saw previously as a Roman symbol for the god Apollo, by this time had also become the symbol of St Oswald, Northumbrian royal saint. And coins during this period are not stamped with a value, since they were made of precious metal, this one's silver, and it would be weighed to check its worth. So it was the weight of the silver in the coin which gave it its worth, uh, and indeed which led to coins often being clipped, small pieces being removed from a number of coins, uh, and if those small pieces were melted down you could then make yourself a brand new free silver coin, and you'll see that coins were starting to include designs such as these dots around the edge, which made it more difficult for them to be clipped because it was easy to see where pieces had been taken out. Coins at this period are still not standard, not as circular as our lovely modern coins, which are stamped out of sheets of metal, because these coins were struck. So a piece, a disc of metal was put between two dies. This was then struck with a hammer so that the design was squished, was stamped into the disc, uh, and the disc was slightly distorted in shape by this process. So ancient coins are never completely circular. So small pieces missing could just be damaged from when it was struck. Um, if it's clipped, you're likely to have a larger piece missing, which actually goes into the design itself. On the other side of the screen, 
we've got an antler cone. This, again, from York, from the 900s, would have been used for combing hair, but also for removing lice from the hair. And the three tooth plates are fixed with nine rivets onto the back plates. So if you look very carefully, you can see that the teeth of the comb, there's a gap, there's a gap. So they're actually made from three separate plates, which are then riveted with the seven rivets you can see running across the top into the spine of the comb. The comb is decorated with diagonal cross hatching and about 10 centimetres long. And you'll see that it's got a small circle stamped through it, which corresponds with the small circle in the case. And in effect, the comb would be lowered into the case, which has a slot, which we can't see because we're looking at the side of the case. And then the two line, the two holes would line up so that it could be pegged into place and didn't fall out of the case because small cones like this were often worn by the owner. So the comb case protected the comb teeth from snagging on the owner's clothes and snapping off. So we're going to move now from Northern England across to the modern country of Northern Ireland, one of the nations in the modern United Kingdom. And we're going to talk about the city of Belfast. And we have on the screen a number of hand axes, which have been found on the site of the modern city of Belfast. Now this site has been occupied since the British Bronze Age. And the giant's ring is a 5,000 year old henge, which stands near the city. And there are also Iron Age forts in the hills surrounding Belfast. And the settlement itself, the city that we now call Belfast, was actually based around a marshy ford where two rivers met. Now, the axes that we can see on the screen here, which give us evidence of settlement in the area of Belfast from prehistoric times, are three polished stone axes. The one we have on the far left, you can see has slight damage to the tip of the stone. Uh, the one next to it has damage at the base and also at the tip. And then the one on the far right is actually a polished stone chisel, which has part of the butt missing. And all of these date to the British Neolithic Bronze Age. They're quite varied in size. Um, I've put them up so that you can get a good look at them. But if you had them on the desk in front of you, you would have one which was 10 centimetres in length. This one, 22 centimetres. And the little chisel is eight centimetres long. Stone axes were made by polishing and grinding their surfaces with sand and water. And it took a lot of time, effort and skill to make them. Stone axes were in use in Ireland from the Mesolithic period until well into the Bronze Age. And most axes were small and fitted with a wooden handle ready for their primary use, which was cutting wood. Now, these axes, these polished hand axes, would not have been used in this way. Although there are signs of damage, there is no sign of them having been used for everyday work. And it's suggested that their value lay not in their function as a tool, but in how they looked and their role as symbolically valued objects to the people of the past. And if you look at them, you can see that the time spent polishing each of these objects, and indeed the selection of the original material, 
which quite often would have been traded in to prehistoric Britain from areas of continental Europe, the stone itself is selected to reveal colours and patterns which then become part of its intrinsic symbolic value. So Belfast, we see human activity in the area in prehistoric times. Let's go forward and let's arrive at Belfast in the 1700s. And by this point, Belfast is a thriving merchant town. The town is importing goods from Britain and exporting linen products, not only to other parts of Britain, but also across to America. And it was actually granted city status by Queen Victoria in 1888. And what we have here on screen are some objects which tell us about the thriving economic economy in Belfast in the 1700s through to the early 1800s. And on the left, we have what is called a piece of watch paper. And you can see it is marked John Wallace, watchmaker and jeweler. And watch paper is a very thin ornamental paper packing, which was placed inside a watch case, ready for it to go from the manufacturer to the shop to be sold to the customer. And this particular piece of watch paper tells us that John Wallace had his shop at 29 High Street, Belfast. And we know that this is where he worked as a watchmaker and jeweler in the 1820s. The building itself had been formerly occupied by a booksellers and stationers. So obviously at this point, 49 High Street is a busy commercial area with shops coming and going in the same way that they do in any modern High Street. Now, the building itself stood at the corner of Pottinger's entries. And if you have a look on the modern Google map that I've pulled up, this is the site of 29 High Street, Belfast. And you can see that it is right next to an entry, one of the Belfast entries, which was a series of narrow alleyways in the city centre. And Pottinger's entry itself connects the High Street with Anne Street. Now, what I think is particularly interesting is that underneath 49 High Street, it notes that the shop is located nearly opposite Bridge Street. And if we look at our modern Google map, we can see there indeed is Bridge Street. So this is operating not only as a navigational aid in the days before A to Zs, but also perhaps a way to associate 49 with what is presumably um, the higher status Bridge Street, which actually it isn't very opposite. It is indeed nearer to Pottinger's entry, but it's interesting that John Wallace has chosen to associate his location with the further away Bridge Street rather than the right next to Pottinger's entry. Now, on the other side of the screen, we have a small number of what are known as trade tokens. And these are all from the city of Belfast. Now, from around 1650, there was a shortage of small change in Britain since the government failed to mint enough copper coinage. The need for small change for everyday low value financial transitions, transactions, meant that merchants started to make their own currency, which we see here on the screen, known as trade tokens. And as long as traders accepted the tokens at face value for purchases, the public would accept them in change. In Ireland, trade tokens appeared in 1653 and continued in circulation until 1650. 
79, when they were replaced by copper farthings and half pennies issued by the Royal Mint. So we have two examples here. At the top, we have the back and front of a copper alloy penny token issued by William Smith, a merchant or tradesman in Belfast. So on the front, we can see it is marked with his name, William Smith, his initials WS, and then on the back, as you would with any coin of the realm, you have the date in which this token has been struck, 1657, and the town, as it was at that point, in which it has been struck. Use of these tokens is very localised. The tokens would have been struck, um, paid for by William Smith, for use by customers in his shop and probably would also have been acceptable in a number of local premises where there would have been an implicit agreement that to aid trade these small tokens were acting as replacement half pennies and pennies in the local economy. One underneath is one issued by John Stewart. We can just make out his name running around the edge. John Stewart. We also have a date, again 1657, and we have his initials. Now of course J is often interchangeable at this point with the letter I. Uh, this is left over from the use of Latin where the sound J is represented by what we would recognise as the letter I. So J-S-I-S, -S, J John Stewart. And then on the other side, we have Belfast, but also the Belfast coat of arms. And this coat of arms dates to 1613, when James I granted Belfast to town status. And this emblem was used by Belfast merchants throughout the 1600s, on signs and trade tokens. And again, if we're thinking about the trade token as a substitute for low value copper coinage, it's again picking up on this idea of building trust in this local coinage, and um, not only by making it from the same materials, making it the same size as the copper coinage that people would have been used to using, but also by giving it a stamp of authority in terms of who had issued it, and also a stamp of authority in terms of the trust that the local community in Belfast and the symbolic value of the coat of arms representing the Belfast economic community in the same way um, that nowadays there will often be a symbol of whichever country issues coinage on the back of the coin, with the name of the producer, or in our case, um, a portrait of the queen on the front of the coin to give that coinage legitimacy. And we'll come across some more trade tokens later on in our talk. But we're gonna move now from Belfast to Edinburgh. And we're gonna find out about the Royal Borough of Edinburgh, which was itself founded by King David I around 1125 on land in Scotland belonging to the crown. James III, the Scottish king from 1451 to 1488, referred to it specifically as the principal borough of our kingdom. So acting at that point as a nascent capital city for the Kingdom of Scotland. Now to the north of the city lay Norlock, which was a natural depression in the landscape flooded by James III in 1460. And it was flooded to defend the city to the north. And if we look at this bird's eye view of the city of Edinburgh, which was printed around 1574 to 1594, we can see to the north of the city, the flooded area of land defending the northern part of the city. 
we can see that the city is defended to the west by its castle, which stands on a rocky outcrop. And then following the Scots' defeat at the Battle of Flodden in 1513, the Flodden Wall, which we can follow here on this bird's eye view around the outskirts of the city, was built to the south and the east, and that consolidated earlier wall defences. Now work on this city, which you can follow with your eye, running across the south, and then straight up to the north, to the edge of the lock. Work on it lasted from 1514 to 1560. And we know from the records that the cost of building this wall was four pounds, 10 shillings per Scottish rood. And a Scottish rood was the equivalent of five and a half meters. So every five and a half meters of this wall would cost you just over four Scottish pounds at the time. And then if you wanted battlements added to the wall, that was an extra 40 shillings per rood. And today, four separate sections of the Flodden Wall survive. Now, we can see that over time, the city expanded beyond these medieval walls. And below, we have a tourist map from the British Museum. It's showing us Edinburgh. And this was issued in 1935. And we can see here, if we line up the castle, which we see here in the top map and here in the bottom map, we can see the extent to which the original city, which sat to the east of the castle, has now extended north into the Georgian new town, set out with its straight lines, rather like Milton Keynes. We can see that the artificial lock has been filled in to create land for building, and that in fact the water, the body of water lying to the north of the city now is the natural Forth of Firth. We can also see that coming south of the city, in the medieval, to our mind, late Tudor map, we can see that there is a small amount of settlement just south of the city. By 1935, this had extended down into an area of the city now known as St Thomas's. And indeed, the city has spread out beyond the castle to the west and spreading out beyond the original city further to the east. So that Edinburgh nowadays is often spoken of as a conurbation drawing in the settlement of Leith. So looking at two maps from two different periods of a city's development allows us to actually plot which areas of a city developed when. And from an archaeologist's point of view, this is often known as an exercise in map regression, whereby you start with the most modern map that you have of an area, and then track back to the very earliest map you have. At each stage, the maps demonstrating where development has occurred, or where indeed sometimes part of a settlement has been lost. If we continue to think about Edinburgh, we know that an important point for the city of Edinburgh, and indeed the nation of Scotland, occurred during the reign of what to us is King James I, the Scottish King, King James VI, who was born on the 19th of June 1566 to Queen Mary, Mary Queen of Scots, and Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. 
Following his birth, internal power struggles meant that Mary, Queen of Scots, was forced to abdicate the throne in favour of her one-year-old son. And the following year, he was crowned King James VI of Scots at Stirling Castle. James VI became known outside Scotland as King James I when he inherited the throne of Elizabeth I in 1603, reigning until 1625. And what's interesting is that because of this change in numbering, uh, which as you can imagine, um, does not recognize, did not recognize at the time, the other King Jameses who had ruled in Scotland and indeed rather overlooked the 36 years that James had already ruled as a king in Scotland before he traveled down to London to be crowned king for England, Wales and Ireland. Um, this means that it's been decided that if there is another King James, uh, which won't be for quite a while, will it? Would you, let's say Prince George decided to call um, his eldest child James. Um, the next King James uh, would be King James the Eighth, uh, because obviously we had a James the Second, who was the Scottish James the Seventh. So the next James will be known as King James the Eighth. What we have here, however, is King James the sixth stroke King James the first and here we see him on a gold coin struck in Edinburgh wearing instead of a crown a tall fashionable hat from the period with a feather and a small thistle to the right and the coin is struck with James the sixth by the grace of God King of Scots. And then on the reverse, we see there is a standing Scottish lion holding a scepter, and above that, Jehovah written in Hebrew. And the inscription around the edge of the coin tells us not only that this coin was minted in 1591, but it has an inscription saying, Thee alone do I fear. And both this coin and the one below struck in Edinburgh and the particular one showing James wearing his hat, which is known to coin experts as a hat piece. Twenty five and a half thousand hat pieces were struck in Scotland between 1591 and 1593. Now the bottom coin, which is also a gold coin, again shows James VI, this time wearing his traditional crown and holding a scepter and orb. And the lettering underneath, this coin dates from 1604 and therefore has been minted at the point where he has taken not only the throne of Scotland as his, following the abdication of his mother, but also taken the throne of England, Wales and Ireland following the death of Elizabeth I. And we can see these titles marked on the front of the coin, where it says, James, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France and Ireland. And on the back, we have the English coat of arms and we have the English, the specifically English arms here in the first and the fourth quarter. We have the Scottish lion and the Irish harp. And the inscription around the edge reads, I will make them one nation. And this is the point where there was a significant change to the coat of arms because as James came to the throne, he introduced not only the Scottish lion, but the Irish harp and also around the Scottish lion, fleur de lis. Because you'll remember that the front of the coin says that James is King of France. And this claim to the French throne had actually begun with Edward III who after the death in 1328 
of his uncle, King of France, Edward, who was the nearest male relative through his mother, Isabella of France, claimed that he was rightfully the next King of France. Uh, the French did not accept this claim, but the English monarchs continued to lay a claim to the French throne. And in 1800, the Act of Union, which joined the Kingdom of Great Britain with the Kingdom of Ireland to create the United Kingdom, saw a continuation of this claim to the French throne. In fact, it wasn't until the French Revolution that it was fully acknowledged that with no French throne in place, there could be no claim to a French throne. And it was George III who dropped his claim to the now defunct French throne. And at this point, the fleur-de-lis were removed from the British royal arms. So if you look at the royal arms nowadays, you'll see that Queen Elizabeth uh, is no longer claiming to be Queen of France, which is, of course, now a republic with no monarch. We're going to move a bit further south, and we are now going to move down to Sheffield. Sheffield, city in northern, lower northern England, derives its name from the river Sheaf, which runs through the city. And the second part of the name, the field, refers to a field or a clearing. And it's thought that the name comes from an Anglo-Saxon settlement in a clearing where the River Don and the River Sheaf meet. And in Anglo-Saxon times, this small settlement sat on the border between the kingdoms of Mercia and Northumbria. And what we have here on screen are details of a single Anglo-Saxon cross, cross shaft dating from the early 1800s. And this is actually on display in room 41 at the British Museum. You can see here the front of the cross shaft. Its correct orientation would have been standing. The cross which would have been on top of the shaft is now missing. It was decorated on both sides. And when I was in the museum the other day, I took a photograph of the back of the cross, which has been hollowed out and forms part of the biography of this particular object. So the cross itself is carved from sandstone and it probably dates to the early 800s. It's one and a half meters tall, although it would have been taller with the cross which originally stood on top. And indeed the whole cross may originally have been painted. Now on the main front facing part of the cross, which you can see I've put sideways at the top so you can look at the image in greater detail, we see an archer kneeling by a vine bearing fruit with vine scroll decoration then running down, as we can see in this illustration, on the two sides of the cross. Now the back of the cross is missing because a trough was cut into the cross in the 1500s. Now we know that going back to its Anglo-Saxon history, decorated freestanding stone crosses played an important role in the Anglo-Saxon Christian cross. And the vine scrolling, which we see decorating this cross, symbolised Christ as the true vine taken from the Gospel of John. And the hunting archer on the front is probably intended as an image of the divine word seeking its target amongst the congregation. The style of the cross itself is Mercian, and it's the most northerly example of this type of cross. And you remember I said that the site of Sheffield at that point stood on 
boundary between the kingdoms of Mercia and Northumbria. And this cross very closely resembles other examples from Bakewell and Iam in Derbyshire. And it's been suggested that it is one created by a single craftsperson from Mercia who carved all three crosses. This one being the most northerly surviving example of their work. In the 1500s, the cross shaft was removed from St. Peter's and St. Paul's Church, which is now Sheffield Cathedral. And it was recorded as having been demolished in 1570, which gives it a demolition date from the English Reformation, when what was seen as overtly Catholic iconography were being removed from church sites across England. At this point, having been taken down as a Christian object, it changed function because the back of it was hollowed out, as we can see here when we stand behind it in the gallery, to serve as a quenching trough in a Sheffield Cutler's workshop. So the front face would have been hidden, probably what has partly protected it because it would have been lying on the ground. And the trough at the back, we have lost the back panel and the internal part of the cross. And this would have been filled with water, looking rather like what nowadays we might see as a modern cattle trough. And this change of function is a stepping stone between two parts of Sheffield's history. And as we go into our break, I'm going to leave you with the second set of objects from Sheffield's history. I'm going to tell you we're going forward a few hundred years. And I'm going to tell you that what we have on screen at this point are a couple of mystery objects. So during our 10 minute break, do have a little look at these objects and see if you can work out what they are. They are both in the British Museum collection. They both talk to Sheffield's later history, a history for which we probably nowadays, when we open our cutlery drawers, uh, most closely associate with Sheffield. And I will tell you what these objects are and then we'll continue with our exploration of some more British cities. Enjoy your 10 minute break. Hello, welcome back indeed. So we've had a couple of suggestions over the break about what these objects might be. Uh, so, so let's begin by giving ourselves a, a bit of context. So we've just been talking about Anglo-Saxon Sheffield. And as we go forward into medieval times, uh, a market was established in Sheffield and it soon grew into a small market town. And by the 1300s, it was noted for the production of knives, which were specifically mentioned in Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. And then by the early 1600s, it had become the main centre of cutlery manufacture outside London. And then during the 1740s, a crucible steel process was discovered that allowed the manufacture of a better quality of steel. And this occurred around the same time that a technique was developed for fusing a thin sheet of silver onto a copper ingot to produce silver plating. And this became known as Sheffield Plate. 1800s saw a huge expansion of traditional cutlery trade, fueling an almost tenfold increase in the population of Sheffield during this time. And it then became the city of Sheffield in 1893. So what we're looking at here are two objects from this Georgian Victorian part of Sheffield's industrial history. The object at the top, someone suggested it had something to do with screws, and it does indeed. It is known as a screw plate, and it's a metal plate with a handle 
with graduated threading holes for making screw thread by forcing a rod through the threaded hole. And usually the thread would be formed by deforming rather than cutting material away. And you can see that on this plate, there are 16 different sized threaded holes, each with two adjourning unthreaded holes. And this particular thread maker, screw maker, was made by I Sorby, a company founded in Sheffield by Isaac Sorby in 1810. He was later joined by Joseph Turner for the company Sorby and Turner. And when we look at this object, not only is the fact that I Sorby is marked on it, a very clear indication of the company who made this piece, but the fact that just above it, it has a Mr. Punch maker's mark allows us to include more detail in terms of dating, because we know that Joseph Turner, who had joined the company, actually added the Mr. Punch maker's mark in 1859. So this must have been manufactured in or after 1859. Down below, we have another object associated with metalwork. This is a steel graver. So a steel engraver, you can see the pointed edge there that would cut into the metal surface for the engraving. And the engraver itself is set into an oval wooden handle. And this wooden handle has tucked just where the handle and the engraving tool meet, a bronze ferrule. And adding this to the handle keeps the wood from splitting because it would have been used with the engraver pointed down to cut through the surface being engraved and then a hammer being struck on the top of the wooden handle to drive the engraver through the metal to make the straight or curved line. And this particular tool was made by Jay Naylor and Sons, who were tool makers in Sheffield. So we have a wonderful synergy here of Sheffield being a city where objects are produced and Sheffield also being a city where tools used to produce these objects are themselves being produced. We're going to move on from Sheffield to our next object. And these two objects are going to help us talk about a Welsh city, the city of Swansea. And what we have on screen are some objects from a local bank in Swansea. The top one is a five pound banknote. And um, not only is this object housed in the British Museum, uh, but as you will often find in these talks, uh, the British Museum managed to get it, manages to get itself into most historical stories because this particular banknote was designed, and we can see it's got a little image on it here, designed by Robert Smirk. And he was the father of the Robert Smirk, who was the architect of the current Victorian buildings at the British Museum. Now, this particular banknote was issued by Neath and Eatons, who were founders of the Glamorganshire Old Bank. And it is, oh, sorry, it's not a five pound note, it's a one pound note issued by the Swansea Old Bank, part of the Glamorganshire Old Bank. And then below it, we've got an unused cheque issued by the Glamorganshire Bank Company in 1890. And this was made by Waterloo and Sons, who were a printing firm on London Wall in London for use by customers in South Wales of the Glamorganshire Banking Company. Now, what we're looking at here 
are a couple of objects which come from old banking companies, no longer extant, which are known in historic economic histories as local banks. Now, the role of a local bank was to function as a commercial bank for the local community. And a local bank in Georgian and early Victorian times would accept deposits, make loans and issue lines of credit. Until the 1850s, these commercial banks were allowed to issue their own banknotes, one that we see at the top here. And these commercial banknotes only traded at face value in the market served by the issuing bank. So they're rather like the trade tokens that we saw earlier. They were an agreed form of currency that operated within a limited geographical area. And the value of note, the note was based on the cash holdings and confidence in the issuing bank. They were later replaced by national banknotes, the ones we use today, issued by central banks or monetary authorities. Now, the Glamorganshire Banking Company, which we see noted here on the unused check, was a joint stock bank which was formed in 1836 from an amalgamation of several other private Swansea banks. The business was taken over by the London-based Capital and Counties Bank in 1898, which was itself acquired by Lloyds Bank in 1918. So anyone who has a Lloyds Bank account, part of the history of that bank is the acquisition of little local banks, as indeed happened with the other major banks that we use today, whereby, whereby there was an amalgamation of small regional banks, uh, which then pyramided up to a smaller number of larger regional banks, which then pyramided up to the small number of national and indeed global banks that operate in the UK at the moment. And the economy of Sheffield at this time was ripe for the operation of local commercial banks because the city itself, during the early 1700s and then on into the late 1800s, was the world's leading copper smelting area. So a very busy, very financially rich local copper smelting industry. And the copper smelting furnaces in the city were able to use coal rather than charcoal. And they also coincided with a period when the mines in Cornwall were increasing their copper production. Swansea thus became the ideal place to smelt this Cornish copper ore because it was close to the coal fields of South Wales. Also, being a port, it was able to receive ships carrying the Cornish copper ore and then export back out the smelted ore. And it was more economic to ship the ore to Wales than to send the coal to Cornwall. And by the 1850s, Swansea had more than six hundred furnaces running around the city and a fleet of 500 ships carrying out Welsh coal and bringing back metal ore not only from Cornwall and Devon but by this time also from mines in North and South America, Africa and Australia. And this economic activity meant that from the late 1600s to 1801 Swansea's population grew by 500% as workers associated with the copper smelting industry flooded into the city. 
Now, as well as metalwork, Swansea, in common with many other cities in the United Kingdom, was also a centre of pottery production. And we are looking at here some examples of Swansea pottery known as Cumbrian pottery. Now, until the mid 1700s, potters usually sold small quantities of their wares at a local market. But after this, potters experimented with different types and different shapes of pottery. They worked on perfecting the glazes that could be used to decorate pots. And they became what is known as production potters, which meant that the pots were made in factories, very often set in moulds, which meant that there was a mass production of a consistent standardised product, which then could be marketed not only locally, but nationally. And we see here at the left, we have a small mug and this mug is made with a blue underglaze and we're looking at the two different sides of the mug. It dates from 1795 and we've already mentioned something that happened around this time, the French Revolution. And this mug is a little insight for us into attitudes towards the French Revolution and also towards the continued monarchy in Britain at this time. So what we have on the left is a rose and a thistle with a royal crown sitting on an architectural structure which if you look very carefully here to the left and then to the right, you can see that the blue in the center is actually tracing the outline of the profiles of George the Third. Here he is, there's his nose, and Queen Charlotte. On the other side of the mug, we have a tangled root system, which is formed from two snakes attacking a fleur de lis. And again, if we look carefully, we can see that these tangled roots are tracing the profile of here to the right, Louis XVI, and opposite him, his queen, Marie Antoinette, and underneath, a broken crown, sword, and scepter. And this mug represents what was a fashion at the time for puzzle portraits. And the design itself copies a puzzle portrait published in January 17. 94 by the printer Daniel Orm. And this was then picked up by the potteries of Swansea and transferred onto a mug so that in your house in Georgian times, you could remind yourself of the stability of the monarchy in England, Scotland and Wales and the instability, indeed the end of monastic, of uh, the monarchy in France following the unrest of the French Revolution. Next to it we have a small flower vase. Now this particular piece dates from quite early on in the pottery's history. It comes from 1806 and it represents a development of the early blue glazed ware, which we saw when we were looking at the mug. Because obviously, the more highly decorative your wares are, the more appealing they are to the consumer. 
the more appealing your wares are to the consumer, the more you are going to sell and the more sustainable and wealthy your business becomes. So around 1800, they took on at the pottery the well-known uh, well botanical artist, William Weston Young, and used him to design flora and fauna designs for their pottery ware, hoping to take on the interest in the fashionable ware that was at that time being produced by Joshua Wedgwood in Staffordshire. So they could see a nissant market developing around the Wedgwood ware in Staffordshire and decided they'd uh, have a bit of that themselves for their wares in Swansea. And we know that this particular piece made in Swansea was then sold in London so would have been transported up to London in the hopes of reaching a wider, more affluent market. And it was sold in the Cumbrian warehouse sale on the 23rd of April, 1808. And then went through a number of domestic holdings until it arrived back at the British Museum as a museum object. Below, we see one of those trade tokens that we referred to earlier. And here we see an example of a trade token that has been issued in Swansea. And around the late 1700s, there was another shortage in copper being issued by the Royal Mint. And in increasingly industrialized towns and cities, there was a high need for low value copper coins, not only for paying wages, but also for the workers to then use in local shops. So again, as a way to fill in this gap in the currency, local firms would start to issue local tokens. And this one, issued in Swansea and South Wales in 1813, was actually issued by the Cumbria Pottery as part of the wages paid to their workers. And their workers would then have been able to use this at the value of a penny in local shops in Swansea. And the shortage of small change was felt throughout the North, the Midlands, and South Wales. Uh, eventually, these copper tokens were made illegal by the Royal Mint, who increased their production of small copper coins. But tokens continued to circulate in South Wales all the way through to the 1870s. We're now going to move from Swansea to Exeter. And we see here another lovely map, and this map comes from the same set of maps that we saw when we were looking at Edinburgh, issued between 1574 and 1594. And it shows us Exeter, a city in Devon situated on the River X. And it gives us a bird's eye view of the city. We have the river in the foreground uh, with a road leading up to the city's west gate. The orientation of this map is not aligned to true north. I've popped in next to it a modern map of the city which is aligned north and you can see here the river and you can see here where that road comes in to the west of the city through one of the city gates to the modern city of Exeter which over time, as we saw with Edinburgh, has expanded beyond the city walls. There's the castle, which we can see in the right-hand map, nestled against the city wall, and which we see, sorry, in the left-hand map, nestled against the city wall, and which we can see in the modern map actually has an area of settlement extending now across to the east all the way to the M5. 
And we can also see that the small, tiny settlement just outside the city gates has, by the 20th century, extended all the way along the river frontage and all the way back down the roads leading out of the city towards the west. Now, this city view also shows us St Thomas's Church, and then we also see in the centre of the city Exeter Cathedral, which is properly known as the Cathedral Church of St Peter's in Exeter. And the building that we see in this map, and also in the present day, was completed around 1400. The castle was built in the northern corner of the Roman city walls, and the walls themselves were rebuilt and extended in the early medieval period, following Exeter's rebellion against William the Conqueror. And these walls, which are a combination of the Roman and the medieval walls, almost 70% of them remain in the modern city of Exeter. Now, Exeter was also the site of another key point in British history, because Exeter saw the arrival of William III as part of the Glorious Revolution, which saw King James II forced to flee his throne, and the Dutch William and his wife, James's daughter Mary, established on the British throne. Because on the 5th of November 1688, William of Orange from the Netherlands landed at Brixham in South Devon with around 15,000 followers, including artillery and cavalry. Here we see up at the left his ships setting sail from the Netherlands, we can see the artillery and the soldiers, which are then being loaded onto this fleet of ships. And in the other image, we see them arriving in Britain, landing at Brixham, and then marching to Exeter. And the cavalry, which included obviously a large number of horses, brought with it 200 African grooms, from Dutch holdings in the Caribbean. Now, as a grandson of Charles I, as well as being a husband of Princess Mary, William had arrived to claim the throne from Mary's Catholic father, James II. And with his forces, he traveled to Exeter, which served as his headquarters from the 9th till the 21st of November. And during this time, Four battalions of infantry and two regiments of dragoons were housed in the city. The remaining forces were billeted in the countryside around. Exeter was then the base from which William marched eastward to London. And below we can see a silver medal produced after his coronation as king with his wife Mary as joint monarch as queen in Britain, and it shows us a bust of William III of Orange. And what's interesting is if you look at the back of it, you can see that this particular scene of him setting sail from the Netherlands has been copied from the print that we were looking at previously. But of course, because the image has been copied from the print, in the tracing of it, it has been reversed. So the print and the medallion show the same scene, but in reverse as the design is picked up by the medal maker, traced, reversed, and then embossed onto the medal. We're going to stay with the seaside for our last city, which is the city of Southampton. Now, Southampton is a port city in Hampshire, and archaeology suggests that the area has been inhabited 
since prehistoric times. Anglo-Saxons established a settlement known as Hamwick, and following the Norman conquest in 1066, Southampton became a major port of transit between the then capital of England, which was Winchester, and Normandy. And the town expanded rapidly in the Victorian era, and the first dock was opened in Victorian times in 1842. And what we have here in the centre is a photograph from the British Museum collections, which was taken at Debenham Smith Photography Studio, 1 Sussex Place, Southampton. And it shows us a young gentleman called Thomas William Edge Partington with his father, James. And it marks the occasion where young Thomas had arrived in Northampton, uh, sorry, in Southampton to join the British Navy as a cadet. And his father, James, was an anthropologist who had a particular interest in collecting objects from the Pacific. And we actually have a photograph of his father showing him at the British Museum, where he worked as a volunteer curator, looking at objects which had been collected by the museum from the Pacific, and in particular from the Solomon Isles and from New Zealand. Now, young Thomas did not spend very long. He joined the Royal Navy in the, on the 15th of July, 1899, but was discharged only four years later in 1903 after failing navigation for the third time. He then joined the British colonial services where he served in the Solomon Isles, picking up on his father's interest in the material culture of that part of the world. And the box of photographs in which we see him as a young naval cadet also includes photographs of him later in life in the Solomon Isles with his wife Mary, where alongside his work for the colonial services, he also continued his father's development of a large private collection of Pacific artifacts and books many of which now form part of the British Museum collection. Now, Southampton, as a key port on the southern coast of England, acted as a point of part troop embarkation in the Crimean and the Boer War. And it was also designated number one military embarkation port during World War I due to its deep water docks, which were able to handle large numbers of ships. And our last two images, the one on the right from the British Museum collection, the one on the left, a painting held in Southampton City Art Gallery, were both taken during World War I. They were created by Richard Wynne Neverson, who originally served as a Red Cross ambulance driver during the war, was invalided out, in, invalided out and was later appointed an official war artist. Now he passed through Southampton on his way to France and it was probably at this point that he created and collected sketches for this painting which shows timber being loaded at Southampton docks to be sent out to the trenches in France and in Belgium. The painting was itself exhibited in September 1916 and served as the basis for the BM print. And again, you can see in the printmaking process, the image has been reversed. And this shows the influence of futurism and cubism with its emphasis on geometric shapes and patterns. This shows the Southampton during the war, during 1916. It continued as a key point for not only the transport of goods, but also the transport of troops throughout the war. 
And then finally, in the 13th of January 1919, Southampton was the site of a mutiny by around 5,000 soldiers who were being taken through the docks, at which point they took over the docks, refused to obey any further orders. Upon finding out that they had been misinformed, they thought they were being transported to Southampton to be demobilised. And in fact, when they arrived in the port, they were informed that they were to board troop ships for France, where the British Army retained a presence after the 11th of November 1918. They mutinied at the prospects of being sent back to the battlefields, but the mutiny was itself brought to an end without bloodshed. I hope you've enjoyed our little journey through some of the British cities held in the British Museum collections. And if anyone has any questions they would like to ask, um, please do. We have a few minutes before the end end of our talk. If anyone would like to ask a question or indeed make any comments about British cities and objects. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was fantastic. What I cool. do coming out of the end of that talk um, is to say, obviously, we've only been able to touch on a number of cities from the United Kingdom. Um, if you have a city that you are particularly interested in, uh, then do go onto the British Museum website and you'll see that there is a part of the website called Collection Online. And this is a database of over 5,000 objects from the British Museum collections with an image and supporting information. It's got a very easy search box. Um, if you pop in the name of a city you're interested in, it will then pull up all the objects that we have in our collections associated with that city. A little tip is that that association um, can be quite tangential. So it's also a good idea to also go down to the places box and just double click that it's the city in England, Wales, Scotland or Ireland, um, because it might pick up a tag based on where the object um, was originally collected from, or it may pick up a tag based on the name of the collector who had collected that object from the museum. Um, or it may even pick up a tag from where that object has been displayed on a touring exhibition. Um, but there are some wonderful objects dating back from prehistoric periods all the way through to modern times that give you a little insight into specific points of a city's historic journey and its growth and development and really remind us the cities that we recognise nowadays usually have incredibly long histories. People often talk about the establishment of towns in medieval times. People often talk about um, the settlements that grew from military forts that arrived in Roman Britain. But it's interesting when you look at collections online that often you can push push that history back into prehistoric times when there may not have been a settlement, but it was obvious that that region and that bit of the landscape was an area that was starting to attract human activity and settlement, which is why, of course, it provides the ideal setting for a settlement to then become permanent and grow in size to become a city. Thank you. Uh, so the first question, um, I always thought cities had to have a cathedral. Is this not the case? Oh, now that is a very interesting question. Usually a city will have a cathedral and you'll know from examples such as St David's City in Wales that the city can be small as long as it's got a cathedral. St David's is tiny, but it has a cathedral. It's interesting because a city can be designated historically um, through sort of a charter or a letter of patent. Nowadays, it will be designated by the Queen via government. And the way in which a city is designated has changed over time. So a city doesn't necessarily have to have 
a cathedral, though usually a city will then designate one of its large parish churches or build a cathedral as part of its city identity. I think what we can say is that anywhere that becomes a city will then usually build a cathedral into its identity. And an interesting example of where that sort of happened in reverse um, is in Guildford. Guildford, which is a market town in Surrey, um, has got a cathedral um, and is continually asking for city status and going, oh, we've got a cathedral, could we be a city? So you can get a cathedral without a city. Um, the next city, I believe, is going to be, oh, South End, they're, they're, they're creating a new city very, very, very soon. Um, but yeah, the simple answer is no, you, there's not a direct, nowadays there is no longer a direct correlation between city and cathedral. You can get one without the other, and as with Liverpool, you can get several cathedrals in one city. Um, hasn't Brighton become a city and have they built a cathedral? Oh, that's a good one. Um, no, I think they've just stuck with the Royal Pavilion. I think that their big civic city identity uh, is, is the Royal Pavilion. I suspect that what they have done is they have designated one of the bigger parish churches within the city area um, to be the lead church for the city. Certainly, if we go back to Guildford, I know that what they initially did was they designated Holy Trinity Church, which is a very large um, church at the top of the high street that originally operated as the cathedral church for Guildford before the cathedral itself was built after the war up on Stag Hill. Um, so I suspect what Brighton will do um, is they will look for a large parish church and then designate that as the cathedral. You can go from a parish church and you can have a little bit of an upgrade. So some lucky vicar will get an upgrade for his or her church. Yeah, a couple of comments on that. Oh, that's right. Yes, someone's just the David Arms murder. That's right. Yes, yes, that that is the late that is yeah. That is the latest city that's going to be as a, as a symbolic acknowledgement and as a commemoration. They are going to confer city status. Yes, it's just popped up in the chat. Yeah, so someone, someone said Sunderland became a city and designated the church as a minster like York. And also Wolverhampton is a city and has no cathedral. Yes, yes. So the, it, it has become more complex over time. Um, if you uh, go onto Wikipedia, um, there is a very interesting list of all the cities in the United Kingdom. And what's very interesting is that it actually gives you the date when these cities were founded. And you can see that there are particular clusters. So a lot of the cities we were talking about today became cities on the back of their industrial development in Victorian times. Um, you then get earlier cities which were created as York was. It was a city under the Romans. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a city in the sense um, that an industrial Victorian city would be seen as a city. So the understanding of what is a city does change over time. And we, of course, are sitting in a post-industrial society where we equate cities with being large and densely populated, which they always were relatively, um, but we also tend to equate them with um, an urban landscape that's industrialized. Uh, so that's another thing I find really fascinating about going back to history and archaeology is that you have to then challenge your own modern assumptions about, oh, this is what a city is with how cities would have been seen in the past and how humans started to construct and make sense of their settlements as they grew. I mean, we haven't even, we haven't even touched on cities and san sanitation and the development of slums in cities. I mean, it's, it's such, such a rich thread of, of historical and archeological knowledge. And I hope a little starting point for you. 
go off and find go off and find a city and, and research and dig 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 just so many things coming out of that that little case study it's like a it's like a little microcosm tiny little ecosystem of of human society in a city all the things that humans have to think about and regulate and how they build relationships with each other and with resources and with the landscape Cool. Um, I don't think there's any more questions, so I think we'll call that a day. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was fantastic as usual. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next Thank you. week. Thank you. Have a lovely week, everyone. Enjoy yourselves. Bye-bye.